Thank you, Daryl. Well, good morning. My name is Todd Malone. I'm the lead pastor here at FBC, and it is wonderful to have you here. It's wonderful to, I think, be welcoming fall. Um, it's great to have that here. Um, and I'm sure all of you are just equally excited that we are in the midst of political You fill in the word. <laughs> Chaos, turmoil, tension. Um, you may not know this, but the job that brought me to Longview many, many years ago was actually a job working in the political arena. Um, and because of that job, I had the opportunity to attend some political rallies, not the huge ones that you see on national TV, more the smaller ones. And um, if you've ever been to a political rally, you know that there's a certain rhythm to them. The way it works, and it's pretty well scripted, is that the crowd gathers and then staffers from that politician will come out and they will hand out all those signs and placards that you see on TV, even the ones that look like they are handwritten. They come from the staffers of that politician. And at some of the smaller ones, like the ones I went to, um, the other thing that would happen is they would give out to pre-selected people, very important that they're pre-selected, three by five cards. And on those three by five cards were written pre-selected questions that those people would ask of the politician. So then the politician would come out and he'd wave or she'd wave and everyone would hold up the placards as if they were their placards. And if it was the right type of rally, they would ask the questions that were given to them and at some point in the politician's short speech, he would talk about how much he is learning from the people of the great state of wherever. And then he would finish and he would leave and the staffers would come back out and they would pick up all those placards and they'd pick up all those cards because they had to take them to the next location and do this all over again. Here's the thing that always bothered me. How is it that these politicians are learning so much from the people of the great state of wherever if they never allow the people from the great state of wherever to actually say anything? See, we have a lot of politicians that are running around right now saying that they know what the people expect from them but they don't actually take time to listen to the people. They come up with their own answers of what the people want. And they want to put those answers into the mouths of the very people that they're speaking to. What are they doing? They are trying to buy votes by telling us what they have decided that we want to hear. They want us to be loyal to them based on their agenda for us. And as you stop and think about that, and it always occurs to us at some point in the election cycle that this is really frustrating. That's just really, really annoying. We would love for someone to actually come to our turf and stay around long enough that we actually get to know what they think and where their heart is. And they would get to know what we think and where our heart is. But that's not what happens. They simply put answers into our mouths that they think that we want to hear. Here's the thing that's fascinating. Micah's audience tried to do 
the exact same thing with God. And that's what we are seeing in the passage that was read for us this morning. They were trying to buy God's vote by telling God what they decided he wanted to hear. And we do the exact same things today. We do it when we treat people badly. We think condescending thoughts about others every time that we gossip and lie or we ignore someone in pain. And then we show up at church on Sunday morning because we think that's what makes God happy with us. And that's how we buy his vote. And in Micah 6, 1 through 8, God calls his people on it. And he calls us on it as well. Now, just as a reminder of where we've been as we continue through this series in the book of Micah, the name Micah means who is like God. And the point of the book is that no one is like God. But the people of Micah's time were just like the people of today. And they put all kinds of things at the center of their life instead of God. The leaders of the Jewish people idolized wealth and power at that time, and it caused them to take advantage of the poor and the powerless. And so the book of Micah is a response to the corruption of the leaders and the people. And it's divided into three different cycles, and we've been working through these cycles. In Micah chapter 1, God comes to judge. Then Micah chapter 2 explains why. He focuses on the leaders and he says they are greedy and they are corrupt. But chapter 2 ends with the hope of redemption and restoration. And then we saw in chapter 3 the beginning of the second cycle. And we just finished the hope second, section of the second cycle last week as Slade took us through the promise that God makes that he will purify his people. And this week, as we start chapter 6, we are starting the third and final cycle in the book of Micah. And we start again in judgment. And what's really fascinating is in this cycle, what God does is he uses the terminology of a lawsuit. The people of his time would have understood That what Micah was representing here was that God was basically suing the people because they had been unfaithful to their end of the relationship with God. And as the lawsuit is stated through these verses, God declares that he has been faithful to his people. He then challenged the people because of their superficial fake faithfulness to him. And then he closes in verse 8 by saying, let me tell you what I want. Let me remind you of what I want. And it's more than about just what we do. It's about who we are. So chapter six begins with Micah setting out God's history of faithfulness in verses one through five. And the point that he is driving home is that God has not given the people any reason whatsoever to break faithfulness with him. So Micah 1 announces that he is bringing, that God is bringing a lawsuit against his people. And verse 1 is an invitation from the Lord for the people to stand up and make their case. And the Lord summons witnesses to hear the case. He summons the mountain and the hills, creation itself, to serve as witnesses for the case that they are going to hear. Why does he do that? Because the mountains, the hills, have been witnesses to the relationship between God and his people from the very beginning. They know the whole story. They've seen all the details. And God says, creation, come and stand as witnesses since you have seen the whole story. And then in verse 2, God tells creation what he wants creation to hear. God is bringing an indictment against his people. We pause there for a second. Remember, in the first cycle, what was the focus? The focus was on the leadership. Now in the third cycle, it shifted. The focus is on the people themselves. The people from whom the leadership came. The people who have allowed the leadership to function the way that they are functioning. 
And he says, my indictment is now against all the people. And the word indictment refers to a breach in a covenant. God has a covenant relationship with his people. He's made promises. He's promised that he would be their God and protect them and guide them and bless them. And he has promised that he would give them purpose. And that purpose is to reflect his character, to be his people amongst all the nations, amongst all the peoples, so that as they are reflecting his character, the nations are drawn to God. And what's the people's responsibility? What's their side of the covenant? They're simply to be his people. They're to reflect his character. That's what they are to do. And an indictment is saying, you have not kept your side of the covenant. You have not been my people. You have not reflected my character to the nations around you. Verse 3 is an invitation for the people to tell him if there is anything that God has done to deserve this breach of the covenant. And God knows full well the answer is no. God expects that there is nothing that they can say. He invites their testimony before himself and all of creation, knowing that there is nothing that he has done to violate the covenant. Nothing he has done that deserves what they have done to him. And then in verses four and five, he starts giving them a history lesson to prove his point. God walks them through the history of the people's salvation and formation as a nation. And the point is that God has always been faithful. See, verse four shows that God freed his people from Egypt But he did more than that. He did more than take them out of slavery. He gave them leadership. He gave them a leader who was a political leader in Moses. He gave them a leader who was a priest in Aaron. And he gave them a leader who was a prophet in Miriam. And they guided the nation into the freedom that God had given them. So God did more than just give them the freedom he promised. He gave them the resources to live in that freedom as he led them out of Egypt and into the wilderness. Verse 5 is loaded with examples of God's faithfulness as it takes him through the journey from Egypt through the wilderness to the promised land. You see, towards the end of Israel's wandering in the wilderness, they were approaching the promised land, and the king of Moab, who was their enemy, wanted to stop him. And he knew he couldn't stop him with military might. And so he says, let me stop them spiritually. And in a really weird thing, if you think about it, he hires a prophet. So I guess it's a prophet for prophet. Um, He hires a prophet. And he says, here's what I want you to do. And the prophet's name is Balaam. He says, I want you, take this money, and then I want you to go curse the nation of Israel. I think that's weird because it's like, okay, so what if he does that? I mean, God's going to do what God's going to do. But um, in their thinking, this works. And so he says, okay, I'm going to pay you money. You go curse the nation of Israel. And when you curse the nation of Israel, then I know that they're going to fall apart and be destroyed. But God steps in and says, no, that's not going to happen. God intervenes. And when Balaam tries to curse Israel, what does he actually do? He blesses Israel right in front of this king who has paid the prophet for profit. Strongly making the point that God is going to do what he is going to do and he is going to be faithful to his people. And then you have references to two cities. Shittim was Israel's last stop in the wilderness before they entered the promised land. Think about that moment. Think about what has happened. They have spent 40 years in the wilderness. They have seen a generation die off. They have experienced the threat of not having food, of not having water. They've experienced the threat of enemies. 
and God has taken them through all of this. And now the promised land that will become their home where they will thrive is within sight. This is a time to celebrate. And that's what God's people do. They celebrate by worshiping pagan idols. They turn their back on God at the very point that they're about to enter the promised land and enjoy God's faithfulness and all he's promised. They turn to the idols of Moab and celebrate. And God is reminding Micah's audience that they have been turning their back on God since day one. They have been doing this for generations. But then he mentions Gilgal. Where is Gilgal? Shatayim was the last stop before entering the promised land. Gilgal was the first stop once they got inside. See, Gilgal is a reminder that despite the fact that the people had turned their back on God, despite the fact that they had embraced idols of their very enemies who had tried to wipe them out, God was still faithful and kept his promise. God brings up these two cities to make a point. He is saying, you have a track record here, people. You have done this to me again and again and again. And guess what? I have a track record too. I have been faithful again and again and again. God has been faithful to his people from the beginning. He brought them out of slavery. He guided them through the promised land. Even when the people turned their back on God, he provided for them, protected them, and he gave them the home that frankly they didn't deserve. So here's what God is saying to them, and frankly, here's what God is saying to us. Always, always interpret your relationship with the Lord through the lens of his faithfulness to you. Always interpret your relationship with the Lord through the lens of his faithfulness to you. The journey from slavery to the promised land was dangerous. The people faced enemies who wanted to destroy them. They faced times where they didn't know where they were going to get their next meal. There were times that, frankly, they wanted to go back to slavery instead of being with God. But God was faithful to them. He kept his word, and he took them to where he promised. Always interpret your relationship with God through the lens of his faithfulness. Our church is watching this being lived out in front of us in living color. We are watching this unfold in front of our eyes. Many of you know Dave DeBoer, who's in our church, and you know that his cancer is back. His family has been a part of this church for a long time. We prayed for him during his first battle with cancer. We rejoiced and we celebrated when the cancer was in remission. And now it's back. And it is serious. And guess what? Dave and Becky are real people. Their families, they are real people. They have fears. They have concerns. There are a lot of tears. But you know what? If you spend any time with them at all, there is something that you see. They are interpreting life through the lens of God's faithfulness. They know that whatever happens and everything is on the table for what might happen, God is using this to help them know the Lord better and make them and others more like Jesus. How can they have this perspective? Because if you talk to them, one of the things that you will hear before long is they will start taking you through God's track record of, of his faithfulness with them. 
They know God's history. They can recount how God has been faithful to them in the past. And so they interpret their present circumstances in light of the history of God's faithfulness. Always, always interpret your relationship with God through the lens of his faithfulness. You're going to face times when you question why God has not given you the, the family that you longed for, the friends that you'd hoped for, the health that you desire, the finances and the career that you aspire to. And in that moment, you're going to be tempted to interpret your relationship with God through the lens of your unmet expectations. And if you do that, you will question God's character, you will question if he loves you. You will question everything about his relationship with you. But if you understand that God has always been faithful to you and he still is, you will interpret your circumstances as something God can use to change you and to change others. He is giving you life with him, which will always, always exceed all of our expectations. Always interpret your relationship with God through the lens of his faithfulness. His faithfulness to you is never, ever in question. But unfortunately, Micah's audience started to question. They stopped seeing God's faithfulness. They thought they had to bargain with God for him to be faithful to him. They thought they had to buy his vote. And they tried to bargain and buy his vote through their own fake faithfulness. That's what verses 6 and 7 are all about. The picture Micah creates in verses 6 and 7 is a picture of escalating extravagant worship. Verse 6 starts with the people asking how they're supposed to come before God and worship him. They want to know how to be in God's favor, how to earn or buy God's vote. And they start with a burnt offering. Now, this is one of the common Offerings that was used uh, for sin or for expressing devotion to God. So it's understandable that they would start there. But then they escalate. You say, what if we gave a year old calf? Well, see, a year old calf, that was the best and that was the most expensive steak. That was the best meat you could give. And there is one time that the Bible told the people to use that as a sacrifice. It was used for the anointing of Aaron as a priest. It is never prescribed for the people in general. Do you see what the people are doing? They're saying, why stop with just a burnt offering? Let's go above and beyond what is required. Then God will be happy with us. Verse 7 continues just by taking that to the extreme. See, it's theoretically possible that a king or maybe an extremely rich family could come up with a thousand rams to sacrifice. But it's not even theoretically possible that anyone is going to come up with a thousand rivers of oil. See, olive oil was extremely valuable. It was used in cooking and lighting and cosmetics. It was used in medicine. It was used in religious rituals. This much oil was impossible for anyone to possess, no matter how wealthy they were. Let me put this in perspective. We live in Texas. We know something about oil and how much it's worth. Think about the oil that we value. Now think about 10,000 rivers, flowing, rushing rivers of oil. And here's the fun thing about a river. It just keeps sending you water. So this thing, it's not like a field that's going to run dry. 10,000 rivers of oil that just keeps rushing and rushing and rushing and rushing. How much is that worth? How do you even, you, you, how do you even put a price tag on that? Whoever owns that is the richest person in the world. No one owns that much. And they are saying, even if we had this, we could give that away. And then verse 7 ends with the most extreme offering of all. 
child sacrifice. The thinking is that if we give up even what we love the most, then God will be happy with us. Then we get his vote. And Micah isn't saying that they're actually doing child sacrifice or offering these things. They couldn't offer 10,000 rivers of oil. He's creating a picture of their mindset. These are people who wanted to live any way they wanted in daily life, but then buy off God by being very, very religious. And I wonder if that isn't one of the most common ways our culture thinks about relating to God today. A lot of people in our culture, and this is rampant in East Texas, think that if you want to make God happy, all you need to do is to get very religious. So we start trying to buy God's happiness. Right? I can clearly remember a time in my life, and I wasn't in East Texas, that I could clearly remember when I was thinking, man, if, if I go to church, then God's going to be okay with me. But wait a minute. If I go to church twice a week, God's not going to just be okay with me. He's going to be good with me. Wait, wait, wait. If I go to church twice a week and I go to Bible study in the middle of the week, wow, God's going to be great with me. Now, if I lead the Bible study, I'm now being the leader. God's going to be giddy. If I give 12% to the church instead of just 10%, if I sit in front of that person who's a really bad singer and I don't make faces, God is going to put heart emojis all over my life. There's nothing wrong with the things that I did. The problem was the mindset. See, fake faithfulness is treating your relationship with God like it's a transaction. If I do these religious things, then God is going to be okay with me. The more I do the more God loves me. And the reason this is fake faithfulness is because we're actually not really interested in being in relationship with God. We're actually not really interested in getting to know God more and having him know us more and to challenge us and change us and to be more vulnerable and open with him. We are trying simply to buy off God so that he won't be mad at us. And what Micah is showing us is God is already faithful. We don't have to buy his vote. We have it. Always, always interpret your relationship with God through the lens of his faithfulness. Guard against this tendency to buy God off by being super religious Don't be the person who is arrogant and condescending all throughout the week, who lies and gossips and cheats all throughout the week and then shows up to church on Sunday just so God will be good with you. There's a better way to live. And it's the life of genuine faithfulness, which is in Micah 6.8. Now, if you grew up in the church like I did, you have run across this verse a lot. It gets quoted a lot. In fact, I have a version of it hanging in my office. It's a terrific verse. But to be honest, until recently, there was a lot about this verse that I just simply missed. I simply didn't recognize what was going on, starting with the fact that it's an answer to a question. It's an answer to a question that's asked in verse 6. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself down before God on high? Verse 8 is answering that question. Verse 8 says, God has actually already given his people the answer to that question. They know what God finds good and pleasing. And then it gives them the list, and the order of the list is really important. God starts with an action. Do justice. To do justice means to be an advocate for someone whose rights are being violated. It's to ensure fairness. Throughout the Old Testament, this was considered a basic requirement of Israel's relationship with God. If there were poor in the community, then people were responsible to make sure that the provisions were made for that person so they would eat. 
If there were families who lost their land, the community was responsible to make provision for that person to keep them from being pushed out of the community since they no longer had their land. The fatherless were to be protected, and all of these groups were to be treated as equals with the rest of the community. You didn't play favorites because of financial status or family connection or social standing. That's what justice was supposed to look like in action. And it was foundational to their relationship with God. To love kindness, some of your translations say to love mercy, actually takes it a step further. See, the word translated kindness or mercy is an extremely important Old Testament word. It's the word hesed. And it refers to being merciful and faithful and loyal, kind of all smashed up into one. You see, God isn't just looking for people who will be merciful, faithful, and loyal. Notice that what he is looking for is people who love hesed. This is a matter of the heart, of what they love, of who they are. They are to be the sort of people who delight in patiently, faithfully, sacrificially helping others. They are to be the sort of people who delight in sticking in relationship even when they feel cheated or betrayed. That's what they are to love. That's the kind of people they are to be. It is beyond what they just do. And then the third takes it a step further. They're to walk humbly with the Lord. Because you see, that's where you get the power. That's where you get the ability to be the sort of person who loves kindness and who acts justly. The word translated humbly actually could mean uh, wise or skillful. So the idea is that walking with the Lord, which is to do the things that he does, which is to live in relationship with him, the idea is to walk skillfully in relationship with him, wisely in doing the things that he does. It means to get better over time at reflecting God's character and as a result, impacting those around us. It means getting to know his character more every single day by being in his word, by being in conversation with him through prayer, by being alert and paying attention to what he is doing in your life every day. In other words, the reason those religious practices are important isn't because we're trying to buy God's love and faithfulness. We have it. The reason things like coming to church and reading the Bible and prayer and fellowship, all those things are important, is because it helps us to know God better and to walk humbly, skillfully, wisely with him. I'm going to pick on someone else named David. A lot of you know David Fisher. Uh, David Fisher is the person who leads eight days of hope trips. In fact, he is on one of those now. Uh, we're leaving today. A ministry, uh, eight days of hope, is a ministry that cares for victims of natural disasters all over the country. And uh, it's really, really remarkable. But if you know David, you know that he does a lot more than just eight days of hope. He is constantly caring for people in our church and in our community who, for example, have a need at their home, something that they need fixed and they can't afford to fix it. And David can step in and help and he, he does the best that he can, but he does more than that. I love hearing stories of David going to the store. David will go to the store and he will meet someone who is struggling and David will meet them with a word of encouragement to a complete stranger. See, David doesn't show justice and kindness to impress anyone, including God. He does it because that is the kind of person that he is. And how did he become that kind of person? Because he walks humbly with the Lord. He has experienced the Lord's delight in justice and kindness. David's heart breaks just like the Lord's heart breaks when he sees people who are struggling. And David knows with complete confidence where his needs are going to be met. 
So he doesn't live asking the question, what about me? When is it my turn? Who's going to take care of me? He knows who is going to take care of him. God is faithful and will take care of him. And that frees him to delight in caring for others. You see, what truly impacts people isn't just seeing us do wonderful acts of kindness, as helpful and important as that is. What grabs people's attention is seeing someone who delights in doing those things because that is who they are. And we become that type of person by walking humbly, skillfully, wisely with the Lord. God comes to his people, his people in Micah 6, and he has a message. That message is, I have a case against you. I have been faithful to you from day one. I have been faithful to you even when you turned your back on me. And your response to my faithfulness is your own fake faithfulness. You want to be whatever kind of person you want, and then you think you can buy my vote by being religious. Micah's message to them and to us is that the life that God calls good is the life that has lived daily walking with God, knowing him better. That's really the point that Mike is making in this passage, and it's the point of the sermon. Replace bargaining with God with walking with God. Replace trying to buy God's vote with living with God day in and day out. You see, the people of Micah's time wanted to be politicians with God. They wanted to buy his vote by doing even extravagant, way over-the-top religious things. But they didn't want God. They didn't want what God asked of them. And that was to live with him every day. Always interpret your relationship with God through the lens of his faithfulness. Guard against the tendency to buy off God by being hyper-religious. Instead, live the life of genuine faithfulness by walking with God and getting to know him better every single day. How do we make a start at this? Well, there are really four suggestions that I have and they follow the same pattern that they do each week. Pray that God would give you a delight in caring for others. You can't manufacture desire on your own. That comes from God's work in you. So make it a matter of prayer that you would delight in that. We are not meant to live the Christian life by ourselves. That's why we give you the discussion questions on the handouts with your family, with friends, with a small group. Spend some time discussing those questions. And every week, I want to challenge you to go back through the passage, read through it again, and pay attention to what does it say about who God is. Because the more we know him, the more we can reflect his character. And then pay attention, because I can assure you that sometime this week, you are going to have the opportunity to extend compassion, kindness, hesed to someone. Seize that opportunity this week and extend compassion. We have on your bulletin a place for you to mark out how you want to respond to the message. Maybe it's one of these four. Maybe it's something totally different. And our staff really does delight in praying with you and for you as you apply God's word to your life. So if you would like to communicate that to us, you can fill that out. If there's something else you want to communicate with us, a prayer request, anything like that, fill that out. There are boxes at each end of the foyer, each side of the foyer that you can drop them in, and we gather those every Monday, and we take a look at them, and we try to pray through them. So um, please allow us to support you by doing that. I want to invite you to stand, and as you stand, I want to invite the prayer team to come forward. These men and women are here to pray with you no matter what you are facing. 
mostly what we want to do is stand with you in the presence of our God who is faithful, that you would feel his support. So if you would like to pray with someone at the end of the service about anything that you're facing, but boy, certainly if you want to know better this God who is faithful to you, even when you're unfaithful to him, come talk with us. Let me pray. Father, we cannot imagine what this type of faithfulness looks like. Lord, again and again and again, we, just like the people of Micah's time and just like the generations before the people of Micah's time, we turn our back on you, we walk away, we pursue things that are not pleasing to you. Lord, we know that. We know that we're guilty of that. But you are faithful. And Lord, you have pursued us with your son that through his death, he may take the full punishment of our guilt on himself and live in right relationship with you. And Lord, we lose sight of that truth no matter how, time, how many times we've heard it. And we think it's up to us to earn your love and your faithfulness even when you have given it freely. Lord, help us, help us to know your faithfulness better this week and to live in light of it. We pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. So here's the thought as you leave. God is already faithful to you. You do not have to buy his vote. So leave here with the joy of knowing that he is faithful to you and the desire to know better a God so diligently stick with you, despite what we've done. You are dismissed.